I don't want anybody to think that I took the microphone away from Coulter because I didn't want to hear him sing. I had to replace the battery. And so hopefully you can hear us and hear us just fine. Good to be with everybody here, and I appreciate the singing of that song. That is a great song to sing any Sunday and every Sunday because it demonstrates the power of Jesus over death. And it demonstrates the basis for the gospel message that we go out and we preach a risen Savior. I realize that the Bible preaches a lot about the resurrection of Jesus. It does not ever tell us what day of the year it happened. There is a national holiday that is being observed this weekend, and I am certainly thankful, as I remember my dad saying many times growing up, that at least this time and maybe another time of year, the world looks to Jesus. But one of the reasons that I think about uh, Easter weekend uh, is because this is the time of the year that we take our young people to a convention in Orlando called Lads to Leaders. And it is something where they get to be a part of various uh, competitions. Uh, they get to be a part of being acknowledged for work that they have done throughout the year. And this is one of those opportunities where we get to see them not only grow and demonstrate how they've grown, but we get to see them excited and happy about participating, excited and happy about being there, and even excited and happy about being rewarded for the efforts that they have gone through in this year. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about some things uh, that uh, happened at the convention. But I want to share with you right now a passage of Scripture. And this passage of Scripture is found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. And it is a very appropriate way to begin this lesson because I shared this lesson with the 22 other people who are in Orlando right now and preparing to come home after this worship assembly that they've just had. And I shared this with them last night and explained to them, as most of you know, I'm not a Saturday Night Live preacher. In other words, I don't wait until the last minute to prepare these lessons, but there were some things that were happening that really stuck with me. And Friday night I started working on a lesson, and I was able to gain a little extra time Saturday afternoon. And then last night, very late, I was able to finish it. And at last night's devotional, I shared with them the basis of this lesson so they wouldn't mean anything, miss anything today because I told them I was going to share this with you. Philippians 4 and verse 9 reads, The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's a great passage of Scripture, not only from the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. It's a great lesson for us today, and it has probably been a guiding light for some of our young people who have learned things that they have received over this year. They have heard these things, and they have practiced these things that they have learned from the Bible and from the example of many of our Adults, many of our parents, many of our other youth leaders who have helped them in these endeavors. And I got to thinking about this passage of Scripture, and I got to thinking about how it really appeals to me because of some of the things that we've done. The picture I'm sharing with you right now is a picture that we take every single year. I realize with all of these lights, it may be a little hard for you to see all 23 faces. But this is the crew that went to uh, the convention this weekend and helped our young people. We had more adults than we had kids. That's okay. Uh, that's a lot of good individual attention is how I look at that. But we had a lot of our young people who were participating in various things, in, in art, in song leading, and, and certainly one of the ones that I think about is speech uh, because that's the one where I have the most input and the most uh, uh, part of the, the training and, and some of the teaching. And so of these people, we had our largest number of young people participating in speech this year. I think we have had three people at one time in the past, but this year we had four. And we have a young lady who is able to give a speech uh, next year. She's in second grade this year, but next year she's allowed to give a speech and she's already getting ready for it. And so we're excited to see how she grows and how she matures and how she gains in her knowledge and understanding of God and his word. 
But I want to talk to you this morning about something uh, that really struck me this year. And it struck me because whereas most of the speech contests occur on Saturday morning of the weekend, this but one particular set of speeches took place on Friday. And so some of the things that were happening, some of the events that I'll explain in just a minute, got me to thinking. And that's what led me to start putting this together while it was fresh on my mind so that I could share it with you. So this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to take a look at a lesson that's very different from a, what a lot of lessons are probably being presented around the world today. We're going to talk about speech contests and eternal life. We're going to talk about speech contests and eternal life. Let me show you what I mean and you'll understand why the reason for the study. I want you to consider something. When you enter any contest, what is your purpose? I think most people's purpose is to win. Now when we go to this competition, that's not our driving motivation. Our driving motivation, as it would be with any adult toward young people, is to help them to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that is our driving focus. But realize that some of these are contests and so there are rules associated with those contests. For instance, when it comes to a speech, based on how old you are, it can only be a certain time. So if you are in a younger grade, you can have your speech go anywhere from three to five minutes. But if it's too short or goes over, you get a penalty. Same thing is older, true for the older kids, four and a half minutes to six minutes. If anything too short or anything too long causes a penalty. And so one of the things that we understand is when we want to win a particular contest or very simply succeed in doing better and better, we have to understand the rules. We have to know what it's all about. And so I want us to first and foremost ask the question, how are we going to gain success in a speech contest? And the very first point to this is you're going to have to plan. You're going to have to plan for that speech. In other words, every single one of our young people who gave a speech this weekend at some point in time had to very simply make the decision, I'm going to be involved. They had to make the decision that I'm willing to be in that particular event. Now you realize that psychologists, psychiatrists, people who have studied this kind of thing, they say one of the number one biggest stressors in anyone's life is public speaking. And so there are some people who are scared to death of public speaking. That's why we try to train our young people when they're young. That's why we try to get them involved while they're young because if they get involved at a point in time where they don't know any better than to be afraid, then when they grow up, they'll be old hat at it. Well, a person has to make the decision, will I be involved? Uh, maybe what exactly does that entail? But ultimately, it's the willingness to begin, to plan for that day when they will give that speech. The second thing that a person needs to do is prepare. Now, when it comes to an actual speech, that means at some point in time, you've got to actually write the speech. You've got to sit down with pencil and paper or on your computer and you've got to put together this lesson that at some point in time you're going to present. As it's Bible themed, obviously that means not only putting together an outline but supporting it with scripture. Making sure that the word of God is presented and presented accurately. So you're going to have to prepare that speech for the presentation of that speech later on. Now listen to number three, you've got to practice. You've got to practice. And if you want to do well, if you want to really grow, if you want to succeed and do better every single time you're faced with this opportunity, you've got to practice. Now I will tell you what I saw in, in some of the events. I saw some kids who were really prepared. And then I saw some kids that weren't so prepared. The reason I can say that without any judgment whatsoever is because one of them's mom told me <laughs> that he had written his speech the day before. And when it came time to present it, you can imagine he read the entire thing. Well, th that's not practice. In fact, one young lady was rather impressed when she, she said, how long have y'all been practicing? And I said, months. 
Sometimes we start in November and December for the April event. However, we didn't quite start that early, uh, but uh, we still have at least weekly meetings for months in order to give them the opportunity to practice and be prepared. Some of you who have been here the last week, not only last Sunday, but this last Wednesday, you saw some of them give their presentations. We had one young lady who's a fourth grader who's never given a speech before in her life. She went back and gave that speech in one of our classrooms to some of our ladies. We had one young man give a, uh, his speech in another class. We we had two other classes, one here and one in the other building for our other two students. And so they were involved and you have seen how well they've progressed. In fact, uh, one person uh, progressed quite a bit just from Sunday to this last Wednesday night uh, when he was given the opportunity to do something that only the advanced speakers get to do and that's an impromptu speech. Some of you saw Wednesday night while during the three minutes that I read the announcements, he was given a topic, a Bible, and an index card and told that at the end of that three minutes, he would need to give a one and a half to a three minute impromptu speech. He'd never done it before. He did very well Friday night. But that's a part of the training. That's a part of the preparation. That's a part of the practice that a person needs in order to do well, not poorly or even mediocre, but to do well, to succeed, to be the best that a person can be. Fourthly, you have to perform. Now, I don't mean that in the entertaining way. What I mean is there has to be a certain point in time where you actually deliver or perform that speech. And so that t time came for one of our students Friday night, for three of our students yesterday morning. They woke up in order to give a speech to complete and total strangers and to be judged by complete and total strangers. But there's going to be that day when you have to deliver what you have planned and prepared and practiced to give. Now, I want everybody to focus on this warning because this is very important. Even after all that work and effort, the winner is decided by a judge. Now, I think you understand that. That's, that's how most competitions are. Uh, basketball has referees. Uh, football has umpires. Uh, uh, we have all kinds of other contests where, where there are officials who show up and determine whether somebody's following the rules, whether they're doing it right or doing it wrong, and, and they're rewarded for doing it right, and they're penalized for doing it wrong. But in this particular case, it's important for us to understand that even if you do everything that, you've, you, that you're supposed to do to lead up to that day, there's going to come a time where all that work and effort is going to be decided by a judge, and in this case, three judges. And what you do is you hope that the judge knows the rules like you know the rules. Because the whole entire event has judges planned and prepared ahead of time to do their job. And guess what? Some of them don't show up. Some of them go missing at the last moment. And so they have to pull in somebody off the street kind of to act as a judge. And you hope that they know the rules. And sometimes they don't. And so rather than judging them based on the standard that was given for them to practice and prepare, sometimes they're judged in other ways. I want you to consider something as we take a look at a speech contest reality check. I want you to consider that you might think if you're that contestant that you actually deserve to win because you planned, you prepared, you practiced, and you performed better than any of the other contestants. That's your opinion, but maybe it's even based in fact. Maybe you have just done a fantastic job in relationship to all others who are registered in the event. I want to remind you of something. The winner is still decided by the judge. The winner will still be decided by what the judge thinks is right and wrong. And when it comes to human judgment, you just simply hope and pray 
that you have someone who understands well what you're doing and why you're doing it. Now, some of you have been wondering, is there going to be a sermon at any point in time? Yeah, and here it goes, okay? I want to ask you the question, how do we gain success in eternal life? Jesus, after all, died on that cross, was buried in that tomb, and as the song we just got through singing taught us, up from the grave he arose. Jesus did that so that we might not have to live in punishment throughout eternity, but that so we might have life eternal with him in that home called heaven. So how do we gain success in eternal life? I'm going to tell you the very first thing you've got to do is you've got to plan. In other words, you need to make the decision whether you're going to be in this event or not. Now, what a lot of people don't understand is that you're in the event whether you like it or not. Eternity is a part of the future of every single soul of man. And that being the case, that means that we have to actually make a choice at some point in time. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 is a passage of scripture that we sometimes talk about regarding the consequences of sin and, and ultimately death. But I want you to understand there's also a choice that's being given there. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 we read, For the wages of sin is death. That means the payoff or the price for sin is death. It, that's what we deserve. When you do a job for someone and you say, I've put in six hours of work, uh, you owe me six hours of pay, well, that pay that was agreed upon uh, ahead of time is rightfully due you. And what the Bible tells us is when we disobey God, when we sin just that first time, we are deserving of separation from him, not only now, but for all eternity. The wages of sin is death. But look at the last part of verse 23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the alternative. We have the option of not being forever punished, but for be being forever saved. We have that option of not having to pay the penalty for our sin because someone else paid the price for us and we now have the opportunity for life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now what I want you to consider for just a moment is at some point in time somebody's got to make the decision, do I want to be on the winning side or the losing side? Do I want to succeed in life eternal or do I want to fail in death everlasting? In other words, we've got to make the decision which way do we want to go? Because the part about which we do not have a decision is that we will go one of those ways. But God has given us the freedom to choose the spiritual path of our destiny. We can either choose righteousness or we can choose unrighteousness. We can follow the Lord or we can not follow the Lord. But we will either end up in heaven or we will end up in hell. And the choice, the time to plan that is now because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed any time except this moment in time. And so a person at some point in time has to plan for their future. Secondly, how to gain success in eternal life? Just like that speech, you prepare. Now, what do I mean by here, by prepare in this particular situation? Well, at this point in time, what I'm talking about is we have to be moved, not by our own actions, but by the Lord Jesus Christ from being outside the body of Christ to being inside the body of Christ, from being outside of his church to being inside of his church, from being lost in the darkness of sin to being saved in the light of the Lord. In other words, according to John chapter 3 and verse 3, Jesus would say, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This is that point in time, just like you have to write that speech before you practice it, we need to become a child of God. And God has given us the freedom to choose that by his grace, by his mercy, and by his precious son's blood shed on that cross. He has given us a way to be born again, not physically as Nicodemus would question him in the greater passage here, 
but it's being born again but in this, time, in this way of a spiritual nature. We are born physically when our lives, uh, about nine months after our lives begin, and we are born spiritually when by faith we repent of our sins, we confess the name of Jesus, and we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus would tell Nicodemus just two verses later. So we have to make that decision, not only that, yes, I want heaven, but I can't just rest on my laurels and say, I want it, but do nothing about it. The journey begins when we turn our lives over to the Lord and we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And as Paul would say to the church at Rome, we go down into that water lost with our sins, but coming in contact with the blood of Jesus, we come out of it clean, white as snow. As Ananias would say to Saul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. We're going to have to prepare by starting the journey. And that's what it means to be born again. Now, there are a lot of people who would suggest from a spiritual standpoint that once you're saved, you're always saved. That is not a biblical concept. That's not a biblical teaching. It sounds good and it's been repeated often. But the Bible says that when a person is born again, they are quite literally, from a spiritual standpoint, a newborn babe in Christ. And I think about the day that, that some of these kids were handed their speech or developed their speech for the very first time. It's kind of like, what do I do with it now? What do I do now? And that's sometimes what a newborn babe in Christ asks. They come up out of the waters of baptism. Okay, what now? What's next? Well, just like preparing that speech, if you want to gain eternal life, you have to practice. You have to practice for eternal life. In other words, you can't just listen. You have to listen and do. You know, James would talk about faith without works is dead. In other words, I can't just believe these things and do nothing about it. God expects me to have a, a living faith, not a dead faith. He wants me to put into practice the things that he has not only taught me, but instructed me. If you've got your Bibles, turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want us to take a look at the first 11 verses here. 2 Peter chapter 1, the first 11 verses. It's in this passage of scripture that Peter reminds a group of Christians, and that is his intended audience when he writes this letter. He reminds them how they need to grow as well, how they need to practice their Christianity, how they need to, to practice godliness and righteousness in their lives so that they can not only think about it and meditate upon it, but actually put it into practice and get better at it. Peter would say in 2 Peter 1 and verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this reason also, listen to this everybody, applying all diligence, you know what it means to be diligent, don't you? to be mindful, to be watchful, to be ready, okay? So applying all diligence in your faith, that is your knowledge and your understanding of God's will for our lives as it's given to us in the word of God, in your faith supply or add moral excellence. In other words, strive to excel in morality. And from a 
spiritual standpoint, there is no moral standard except that which comes from God, which is why we read the Bible so much, which is why we study it so much, because I don't want to develop Kevin Patterson's moral standards. I want to develop God's moral standards. And so I need to excel in that pursuit. And in your moral excellence, knowledge continue to grow. It's interesting when Jesus said, uh, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He didn't stop there in Matthew 28. He continues on and says, teaching them those newborn babes in Christ, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. It doesn't take long to bring someone to the waters of baptism. But it takes the rest of our lives to grow in the knowledge of God's word and to apply it to our lives. In your knowledge, self-control. Okay, I've got to practice self-control. That means when I'm at the line at McDonald's and there are 57 of us in line and one person at the counter, or I find the same situation in Walmart, it means I need to demonstrate a little bit of self-control. Other people are getting upset. Other people are getting mad. Other people are getting frustrated. They don't take into consideration sometimes that a business has shortages. Businesses have difficulties. We're dealing with supply chain issues in our world today. We're dealing with inflation. Uh, we're dealing with businesses unable to pay employees what they could before because maybe they don't have the income coming in in the first place. They just kind of lose control. They start getting mad. They start griping and whining and things like that. I need to practice self-control. When everybody else is losing it, they need to look at us and see the standard. And guess what? That means practice. I want you to look at the next one. And in your self-control, perseverance. Not just giving up or giving up too quickly, but persevering, weathering the storms, moving through those difficult times. In your perseverance, godliness. Now that just simply means being like God. Obviously, none of us are going to be God. Only God is God. But God has all kinds of qualities that I need to imitate, that I need to practice imitating in my life. And I need to strive to do better and better. In godliness, add brotherly kindness. So it's not just the imitation that I have of those godly qualities in my life that's important. I need to turn around and take one of those qualities in particular, kindness, and I need to share it with others. First and foremost, if I take the principle that is given to us by the Apostle Paul, I want to especially be good to those who are of the household of the faith. But I want to share kindness with all people. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan, how the, the religious guys are the ones who walked on by the fellow who had been beat up and mugged and, and left for dead. But the Samaritan stops and is kind. He's supposed to be the bad guy in the story, but the bad guy in the story ends up being the good guy. Why? Because he showed kindness and compassion for his fellow man. Do we do that same thing? Do we practice that not only with one another, with a very special kind of brotherly kindness being in the body of Christ, brothers and sisters in the family of God. But do we share that kindness with the brethren of the world? And I'm talking about humanity of mankind, of all who are created by God in his image. Do we demonstrate that kindness? And in your brotherly kindness, love. Love. You know, we sing songs, God is love. Because the Bible teaches God is love. And there are several kinds of love that the Bible talks about, but when we usually talk about godly love, we talk about agape love. That is a very selfless love. That is doing for someone else what is in their best interest, what helps them regardless of how it may or may not help me. But I'm going to do what is right before God to seek his pleasure, I'm going to do what is right to seek your best interest by setting the very best example I can be. Look at verse 8. It doesn't ever stop. The practicing continues. For if these qualities are yours and are, are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful 
in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, I want to make a point out of two things in that last section of Scripture. Uh, the one is the negative. In verse 9, he says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. It's kind of like I went through that conversion process. I was born again. I became a member of the family of God. I'm saved by the grace of God. That man who died was buried and rose again. That man's sacrifice, it's almost as if it means nothing anymore. I've forgotten about it. I'm blind. I'm short-sighted because I'm not continuing to take this event called salvation seriously. That happens sometimes. Lots of people want to show up on the day of the contest assuming that they will just win. But that almost never happens. Only the people who have planned and prepared and practiced are the ones who succeed. The other part of this is that he goes into saying, he says in verse 8, if these qualities are yours and are increasing. In, in verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all, the more, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. That's the biblical principle, that we practice good works that we practice our faith, that we practice godliness. That's what real Christianity is about. That word Christian, we say it a lot. It is not just Christian, it means Christ-like. How am I going to be Christ-like if I don't practice being like Christ? It's not something that comes naturally. It's not even something that comes easily. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. And the longer we stick to it, the better off we'll be. Because guess what? <laughs> There's a time to perform. Now some of you might think, well, that's judgment day. No, no, no. That's after the performance. The performance is when we get called on the carpet sometimes. The performance is when we get challenged to not only teach what we've learned, but to show what we've learned. I, I give you the example of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul has just told the young preacher, Timothy, about how powerful the Word of God is. He, he's talked about how it comes to us by inspiration or by the very breath of God. And so that book that we hold in our hands, or as the case might be, that electronic device that represents the book that you hold in your hands, it is that Word of God that is given to us by God and is helpful for us in all kinds of ways. Paul says to Timothy in this passage of Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. In other words, there's going to come a time for you to preach what you have learned. There's going to come a time when you are going to declare what you've been studying. There's going to come a time when you will share what you have learned for yourself with someone else. In other words, it's going to be a time where you cannot keep the knowledge to yourself. You cannot keep the Christianity to yourself in order to be truly Christ-like. You have to perform. You have to share the good news of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world around you. Why? Look at the very next thing that he says, verse 3. The time will come when they will not endure sound or good true doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will not endure sound doctrine. I'm sorry, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. On that day that you perform, there are going to be people who are going to praise you and there are going to be people who are going to criticize you. I heard yesterday of some parent who was in a 
who is sitting in the room in a song leading competition when his little boy was getting up and leading singing and I was told by the judge later of the eight contestants in that particular event the daddy sang really loud for his kid but sang almost not at all for everybody else's kid well that's not the right attitude that's not the right approach. That's certainly not teaching the right lesson to our children. We want to support all of them as they're growing and learning. We want to support all of them and encourage all of them. Uh, but guess what? Some people are just like that. Some people, they will only be encouraging to those who tell them what they want to hear. There are, only, there are some who are going to be encouraging only to those who listen to what they want to hear. But what we've got to do is we've got to be ready in all circumstances. Paul would say in verse 5, You be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. In other words, you've been studying to be a preacher. Now preach. You've been studying to be a song leader. Now sing. You've been studying to be a Christian. Now be like Christ. Warning, warning, how to gain success in eternal life, plan, prepare, practice, perform, but there's a warning, and that warning states, even after all that work and effort, eternal life is still decided by not just a judge, but the judge. And here's what's great about the judge. Number one, he knows the rules because he wrote the rules. Number two, he will always be just in his decisions because he never makes a mistake. You know I'm talking about God. You see, it's important for us to have, once again, another little reality check, but this time in regard to eternal life. You might actually have the arrogance, the audacity, the haughtiness, the ego, you might actually think you deserve eternal life because you planned, you prepared, you practiced, and you performed better than any of the other contestants. And who knows? Maybe, just maybe, that's possible. Out of all the seven billion people on the planet, you might just possibly be the most righteous person in the world compared to the mistakes of others. But eternal life is still decided by the judge. You see, it's important for us to understand two very important points. Number one, you will never gain eternal life due to the merit of your deeds. In other words, not a one of us who has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, and are deserving of those wages of death, eternal separation from God, not a one of us can ever do so much good work that we can show up on the day of judgment and say to God, I, you owe me heaven because of how righteous I've been. James 2 and verse 10 will say that if I do everything right and still sin in just one point, I'm guilty of it all. So if that's the case, I can't say that I'm earning my salvation. Not at all. Why? Because not only is it important for us to understand that I'll never gain eternal life because of my deeds, my works, the merit of such things. It's important for us to understand that we're only going to gain eternal life due to the merit of of the deeds of the Son of God. Have you ever heard of somebody who wears rose-colored glasses? Jesus dying on the cross allows the Father to see us in blood-covered glasses. Blood-colored glasses. In other words, he doesn't see us simply for the sinners who are lost because of our transgressions. He sees us through the cleansing blood of Jesus as souls that have been saved. But one of the as he is in the light, 
because not only is that a commandment of God, but the blood of Jesus' Son will continue to cleanse us of all sins. We want that. But we have to remember that that's not, that salvation comes about, that cleansing comes about, not because I earn it, but because he freely gives it. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 for just a moment. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul would say to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, he would say, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is not working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. What Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus is, remember where we all were before our conversions, before we were born again, before we started living this Christian lifestyle. He says, we were lost. We were steeped in our sins without no hope in this world. But verse 4 reads, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now look at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. The same sentence that he said before but this time he adds through faith. In other words through our knowledge and the practice of what we do. Our works don't save us in and of themselves, but they are expected by God in each and every one of us. He wants us to have a faith, and he doesn't want us to have that empty, dead faith. He wants us to have that living, vibrant faith that listens to him and obeys his instructions. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to walk in him. He wants us to walk in those good works. He wants us to, wants us to be a, 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 a progress he wants to see us growing and, and getting better in our desire to please him and live our lives for him. I'm going to tell you that everybody who competed in this event over the course of the weekend did a good job. And we praised them and we encouraged them and uh, some were uh, a little disappointed in the, the results of some things and others were excited about the results of other things, but uh, they all did a wonderful job. But two things that I said to the kids in the room last night with all of the adults present when we had a Devo, I said, those of you who did well, don't rest on your laurels because you'll go against bigger competition next year. You'll go against people who have been practicing since this event for the next event. And if you don't do the same, how will you fare? And I said, for those of you who did not fare as well as you thought you wanted to, let that be a fire in your belly to drive you to work harder and to do better in preparation for next year. Remember even if you seem to do ever, better than everybody else in a contest, the judge still determines things. And sometimes they don't always do the right thing. But that's the great thing about eternity. God will always do the right thing. And he loves us, wants to save us, wants to live forever with us. But he does expect out of us planning, preparation, practice, and performance. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 15 and 16. Read the following. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. 
Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation, both for yourself and for those who hear you. You see, God has put the decision in our hands. Do we want to be saved or don't we? If so, let's make the decision today, yes, I want to be in heaven. And if you are outside of the body of Christ, if you have not put on Christ in baptism, then make the decision today to be born again and rise to walk in newness of life. But don't think that's the end all be all of where I am spiritually. No, now start practicing. Start practicing to get better and better. You're not going to earn your salvation if you practice hard. But you will please the judge. You will please your creator. You will please God in heaven above. And when you have the opportunity to perform, when you have the opportunity to put those things you've been practicing into real world scenarios where you can teach and share the good news with others, not only by word, but by your deed, maybe not only will your salvation be secure by the grace of God, but you might help someone else along the way to make it to heaven one day. Maybe you're here this morning and you have uh, put the, uh, made the decision before to put on Christ in baptism, but maybe you haven't been living like you ought to. We're about to sing a song in just a minute. We'll stand and sing that song in just a minute. And that song is going to be an invitation song. That, that simply means that the Lord invites you to respond. You can come down to the front row. You can raise your hand. You can hand me a slip of paper. They're saying, I'd just like to have some prayers. Or I'd like to have a Bible study. Could we get together sometime so I can learn how to uh, better plan, prepare, practice, and perform for the Lord so that I can be pleasing to him in all the things that I think, say, and do? Because, guys, one thing's for sure, when it comes to an event, I always want to do my very best. Sometimes I don't. And I try to learn from my mistakes. You might find it interesting that Kuo, one of our contestants who performed on Friday night, right after the whole thing was over and all these months of preparation and practice was over, you know what he and I did by ourselves in the hotel room? We reviewed his speech and critiqued it. <laughs> Why? So that he'll be better the next time. Folks, that's the attitude we need to have before the Lord. How can I be better? How can I better serve you? How can I better please you? And if we can help you in any way to answer those questions, let us know how we can. While together, we stand and sing.